Hello, everyone. Welcome to this. Uh, well, for us here in the uh, east coast of the U.S., um, noontime program. Um, as you're coming in, please let us know where you're tuning in from. We'd love to know. Um, I see some familiar names. Emily, hi. Um, Annapolis, Maryland. Now let us know where you're tuning in from. Aaron and I are at the museum. Um, Aaron is literally in the museum. I am in the carriage house next door. Um, and Oliver is in the UK. And from stores in Hartford. Or seconds to see if people where people show up. Westwood, Mass, Shelton, Connecticut. <clears throat> Go ahead and get started. Um, hi, I'm Omar Acevedo, and I'm the literary program coordinator here at the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. And I'm delighted to host this program for Once Upon a Tome, The Misadventures of a Rare Bookseller. First, I need to thank our sponsors. Our virtual programs are produced in part with support honoring the late Frank Lord. Um, we are very happy to honor his memory with these, with these programs. And we are also incredibly grateful to the Wish You Well Foundation and Connecticut Public WNPR for supporting all of our virtual programs. As a nonprofit organization, the Mark Twain House and Museum depends on contributions to share our enriching author programs like Once Upon a Tome, education initiatives, and other events with our community. If you plan, if you can, please consider donating. Um, I'll provide a link for that in the chat. Um, so uh, today we are welcoming um, Oliver Darkshire for a discussion of Once Upon a Tome, which explores the life of one of the world's oldest bookshops, its brushes with history, its joyous disorganization, and the unspoken rules of its gleefully old-fashioned staff. Um, our author, Oliver Darkshire, is, a, is an antiquarian bookseller at Henry Southern Limited and the voice of Southern's Twitter account. You can also follow him at Death by Badger. Um, he lives in Manchester, England with his husband and his neglectfully curated collection of books. Um, our moderator is our own Emily Bertram, who is the school programs coordinator here at the Mark Twain House and Museum and has been in that position since 2019. Um, we encourage you to have a conversation in the chat. If you have a specific question, you can post that directly into our Q&A section. Um, please also note that you can click on, on, on captions to see live auto captioning uh, for the program. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, I will be putting a link in the chat to purchase um, Once Upon a Tome through our museum store. Um, and your purchase will support our museum and our honored guest. Um, that is all from me. Um, I will turn this over to Oliver and Aaron. Thank you, Omar. Uh, and I'm so pleased to be talking I, I have followed Sovereigns on Twitter, one of my favorite accounts, and then to all of a sudden um, have the opportunity to read your book and talk to you about it is, is really exciting for me. Um, I will say I've done a lot of these programs. This is the book that has made me sort of bark out loud with laughter the most. Uh, and I sort of wonder if my coworkers in neighboring offices were wondering what was going on. Um, there are, this is just a, such a, beautifully and wittily written book that will be enjoyable for anyone who who has worked in a space like this, who enjoys spaces like this. Some of us may find ourselves in those pages. And just in, in many ways, anyone who works in one of those workplaces where everyone is a character. Uh, so I wondered, Oliver, if you could start by telling us uh, not so much about why you wrote the book, but about how you ended up there and the very unique employment position you found yourself in uh, when you started at Southerns? So I have this bit that I tell where I say that everyone who 
enters the rare book trade does it by some kind of accident um most of my colleagues would agree they ended up at henry sutherland's by hook or by crook usually by walking in and not leaving um in this particular instance um um, it was a few years ago now, the UK government were running a program, they called it the apprenticeship program, and what they meant was um, people to cut hair, um, put lights and, you know, on the walls, you know, lay down tracks, things that required you to be, uh, have a hands-on apprenticeship with the person who could show you in person what was going on, you know, um, and Southerns were looking for someone to man the front desk, um, because people kept leaving, they couldn't cope. Um, and so they said, well, well, we'll hire an apprentice, thinking it was the Dickensian kind of printers, 1700s printers where you would you know, sweep things and, you know, people would yell at you. Um, and so they, they uh, and you got, a, you got a grant for it as well, and booksellers love money. So they uh, put this advertisement through the, this official government scheme, um, which, you know, <laughs> and, and left it, they forgot about it, I think. Um, and so I was going through, you know, looking for something to do because I'm un unemployable, um, which turns out is a requirement for book selling. Um, and so I, I stumbled across it. it was one in a series of encounters I you know to a long series of interviews I was trying to <laughs> I was heading off to one by one I, I walked in the yeah. in the door um the manager mess of hair you know took me downstairs to the forbidden catalog room full of books um asked me if it was true that I played the trombone um, and then hired me um and so that was the, <laughs> that was the, end of the rest of it the rest of its history as I say you walk in you keep turning up every day you just don't leave against your best interests you know and then he's not i i worked briefly in one of these bookstores and i got the job by walking in and saying it looks like you could use some help with, <laughs> with yeah. a computer so i think that is the that it does attract those kinds of people and you know you talk a bit about how you know this isn't a, a trade in the way that that the apprenticeship program may have intended but it is a, a trade and you you really do some good work differentiating you know working in this space doesn't necessarily give you the skills or the temperament to work in a uh in an archive or in a, a library or in a museum it's a it actually is a very specific thing and i wondered if you could talk a bit about the very unique language of the book selling world that everyone has to confront and be baffled by when they when they start yeah i think it's um really important to note that rare book selling is a completely different trade a lot of the people who left the job before me did so because they thought that getting into a rare bookstore was a good stepping stone to getting into a library or an archive and really you need a lot of degrees and qualifications for those <laughs> and rare book selling not so much it's a hands-on profession it involves a lot of people bringing in random stuff to you every day and you being able to think on your feet and identifying it as best you can and then moving on to someone else you know it's a lot of stuff comes through a lot of material um and to do that the booksellers you know invent have invented their own I say invented um evolved a language to quickly identify and uh, as best you can object from a distance you know that requires its own terminology its own language really designed as far as I can tell to as a shorthand um for use in catalogs um, there's booksellers catalogs that always send them out massive print things, dense breeze blocks of catalogs. Um, back in the day, of course, when they, you know, until very recently, you couldn't afford to send color pictures of every book you had. So the language was designed to identify, so that you, if you, you could look at the page, look at two lines of text, and I get an idea in your head of what the book looked like and what condition it was in as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And so words like, you know, boxing, you know, to describe the, the mottling of the pages, you know, that's, it's a shorthand so that you can think to yourself, OK, I know what that looks like. Um, and I don't have to use 10 words when I could use one. It saves ink, saves paper when I'm already sending out a huge store full of books. As we know, the books only grow in number as you <laughs> over the years. <laughs> and in 250 years of book selling, you get a lot of backstock. Um, so that's the advantage of it, really. Uh, having to learn that language was a large part of the apprenticeship, really. Um, yeah. You had that. You had that initial first thing of, well, this book looks good and this one just looks fine. Right? And then <laughs> I was told so if you want to explain those two scolded. words are baffling to people. <laughs> yeah. If I if I say it looks good, I'm basically saying it should go in the garbage. Garbage. Um, absolute garbage. If it's very good, it's okay. So the qualifier is there, but no other word, no other qualifier. Very is the one you use. So it's it's very intricate. And very specific and you know one word out of place you might as well just throw a thousand pounds in the bin so you know. yeah well and it was good to know that fine had initially the same 
you know, that also doesn't mean that in yeah. In, like it, it, that's just like, oh, well, it's fine. No, it's, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. I, we don't. I was told off for using it once. I was like, we don't use that. We don't pull that out of the bag or unless we mean it. Um, you know, unless we actually, unless we really mean it. So you have to, you know, almost when I started, I was quite casual with my language, and you have to really reel it back in to very specific words. The words don't mean what they they seem to mean. Um, there's a really good um, what's it called? Uh, Carter's ABC of Book Collectors is my favorite. <laughs> Um, because it has all these, he's quite sarcastic. Um, and they've updated it a thousand times since he wrote it, I think. But um, it's got all these editions. Like he has a little commentary on why the words mean what don't mean what they you think they mean. Um, and it's like I had a copy given to me. It's sort of in my bookshelf now. It's my <laughs> I always go end up going back to it. Yeah, and that's and it also kind of gets to you know this is uh, you know one thing I think some people might be drawn to the trade for and then not like is. It is a very particular kind of retail that that some of saying foxing is, you're not saying there's brown splotches on many of the the pages. Some of this is about the art of the sale, and you, uh, I think this is the best uh, distillation of the types of people. You do a lot of um, you know almost building sort of this is the phylogeny of of the people who who work in and shop at and bring books to. Uh, to one of these places. I wonder if you could tell us some of your favorite uh, types in these areas and how you negotiate and work with them. Yeah, so I mean, I mean book selling at its heart, I mean, it's not research so much as it is um, you know, social services. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> you're, you're one of the only types of expert that people can access at street level, at height. Now, it can't necessarily walk into a library and speak to someone all the time to make an appointment. An archive is more difficult, museums even more difficult. They feel they can go into a bookstore and you know and, and ask you things um so you get a lot of different kinds of people as you suggest coming in it's almost a zoology of different kinds of people and who'd want different things and a small fraction of those are customers <laughs> <laughs> and a smaller one the kind that actually pays your bills and everyone else is part of the ecosystem that keeps the place running whether they're bringing you books good things or whether they're you know um even just wandering around so that someone else feels able to come in <laughs> Um, which is also important, you know, people yeah. like to be somebody's already inside, um, or whether they they might buy something once in 10 years, but that that requires you to talk to them every few months in between, you know, just part of the buying schmoozing process, you know, you talk to them, you talk them into it. There's a whole different, there's almost a big Venn diagram of different kinds of people, um, you know, which in some cases, you know, um, as sort of represented in the book, I'm sure some of them don't want necessarily want to be dealing with book dealers, um, to get what they want, but you kind of develop this symbiotic relationship with them where, you know, the collectors need someone to get them the books and we need someone to buy them. Um, and so you're going to grow on each other over time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's it. Yeah. Organic is the way of doing it, like a natural like a ecosystem is a way of describing it, I think. Yeah, and there is no sort of, um, I mean, I hesitate to use such, such job center language as like soft skills. Uh, but but it is really a lot of that, and you can see the amusing sort of like, oh, that person's come in. Who, who's the last person to look busy? And then they <laughs> and then they have to to kind of uh, manage that. But you also do. I was I was frankly amazed. It took me to page two hundred and one to find mention of a zero fail, um, <laughs> especially well, because, because of the eagle lectern. I was like, oh no, well Crowley's here as as well. <laughs> um, but you do a really wonderful job of talking about the the space and you know building kind of a mental map of uh, of this kind of warren of a of a place and the other seller and then there's the other other seller all, all of these and and the kind of landscape of of the street um, it's a it it kind of builds out from your desk which is itself a fraught topic and worth uh, <laughs> engaging in. Um, which I, I really enjoyed um, kind of getting to know both the workers, the people that you work with, and the, the space that you um, occupy. And I wondered if you could talk a bit about uh, your setup, where you are, and kind of the different work environments that people have made for themselves in Sovereigns. Gosh, yeah, that's a, that's, that is an interesting one, because each bookseller has their own almost little domain um, of the store in which they operate, uh, where they have the books that they know how to catalogue, and everyone is responsible for their own little fiefdom 
carved out of the bookstore almost with their, with their space. And people treat it very differently. So I work in um, literature with my colleague, Rebecca, and my desk is a mess. Um, there's stuff that piled up to the left hand side of it and all that stuff's in the drawers. Like I, I, if I can't trip over, I'm waiting at my desk, I'm not busy enough. Mm-hmm. My general rule. Like I have to really be kicking, kicking bins out of the way to get there. <laughs> and, and she is incredibly organized. Like not a thing out of there. I keep saying that time will break her, but it hasn't. Years in, she, you know, the ruler goes in the <laughs> ruler pot, pencils go in a line. And so it's almost this strange dichotomy when you walk into the literature upstairs because I've got the, just the hell on earth on one side and she's got this like immaculately presented <laughs> desk on the other. And the kind of further you spiral out from that, the older it sort of gets because you have the artifacts of the owl and the bell jar in natural history. That's where he lives. Um, Chris, who runs the science, who is a manager now, hates Dave and wants to sell him, but nobody will buy him all the owl and a bell jar. So I feel like he's safe. Um and he has stuff stuffed in. He has years and years of things like piled under his desk, sort of that almost develops a kind of natural mountain-like formation. The stratigraphy over time, really, <laughs> of objects that have been discarded. Um, I opened a drawer to look for something the other day, and there were books piled at the back behind that had fallen through the drawer. Um, and Rebecca almost had a heart attack. And I was like, "We just don't talk. We just leave it. Just put them back. Just <laughs> just close the drawer, and no one needs to know." But um, no one was missing them till now, so right. So, like, how much of a problem can it can it really be? And sort of, as you get further down, you've got our travel department, which is full of artifacts. He loves collecting doodads, mm-hmm. um, like things like trays with like butterflies in them, or um, like made from butterflies or whatever. And then, um, I know it's ghastly, isn't it? There was a fashion at one point. Um, and he has a that was a mortar shells. He loves his mortar shells. He gets rid of one. He gets. I keep saying he can't sell them, and he does. So he loves his artifacts you know it, it's a progression the further you get into the bookstore of more things eventually leading as you say to tunnels and cellars and hatches that we don't open i was looking for i was paging through trying to find mm-hmm. dave uh the illustrations in this are truly spectacular <laughs> once i got through the first chapter and i was sort of like well that's queen victoria's face on a on a gourd gourd slash gourds then I started to, with each with each chapter opening and each image, like wait for what is the revelation going to be <laughs> with, with these beautiful typical descriptions underneath. Uh, decorative bell jar provided at no charge. Uh, so the amount of uh, one thing I was sort of kind of made me feel good was uh, some of the stories about going out and going through people's libraries and that kind of part of this ecosystem isn't just going into a library and, and sort of saying, I don't I don't want any of this. It is kind of part of your job to value other people's value um, of their books. So I wonder if you can talk about some of the times that you have kind of gone out uh, to look at people's collections and what that process looks like, uh, mercenarily and emotionally. Yeah, it, it's tricky because, I mean, presuming that somebody comes to you and says, I need all my books valued, and they they have more than three, like, or usually they'll want you to go to their house to look at it because he wants to carry books through central London. It's a mess. You can't drive. So we get, get, do a lot of house visits. And firstly, you're, you're entering someone's living space. It's an element of you're already invading their, their home to come and look at their things. And they already feel a little, um, little under pressure that a stranger's in their house. Um, and then you have to go to their their collection, which they've usually painstakingly put together over many, many years. And you have to be quite careful because you don't want to march in and say to them, it's, I want nothing or I want two things in your library with God, because whatever it is, they've spent a long time, they care that they've enough to have had bookshelves put in and they've lived with them in the background of their lives for however many years it is until they're looking to get rid of them. And often they don't want to get rid of them. They're downsizing or they just think it's time and they don't want them to get lost or they're returning them to the trade so that they can, you know, because they're, they're, maybe their descendants don't want them or something. You know, I have a lot of kids, but they're not interested in reading. It's a lot of stories like that where they don't really want to part with them. So you have to go in with the attitude that you're you're kind of negotiating with someone who doesn't really want to get rid of them in the first place, even though they've come to you. This is usually our last resort scenario. Um, and so it gets a little tricky. We went to a house in Barnes in South London uh, a year or two ago, uh, where this chap said, you know, my wife wants me to get rid of some of my book because we're moving out and the house is going to be much smaller. We just can't fit them. So we went down there. We looked at his books. He had them everywhere. Like he had one room organized and the rest of them, we literally couldn't fit into them because the right up to the door, you have, you know, you have to deconstruct the room 
your bare hands. Um, and we, we we went through his books. We valued him. We took some away, and we said he get some money. And he, the look on his face—he looked like we were <laughs> ripping out his liver and eating it in front. You know, he was so heartbroken. And then you know, he, eventually, when, when we'd done the first lot, he said, "I just can't bear it. I cannot bear to part with any more of my books. I'll just live in a hut." Um, and so, you know, it, it's it's like that a lot of the time. Like e even when you don't want any of the books, you have to be aware that you're dealing with something that somebody else cares about, even if you know they don't have a, as much commercial value as someone would like. So yeah. softly, softly, usually. Yeah. Well, and and I think one thing one thing that was a struggle for me when I was sort of first in this space was confronting the fact that reading books was not necessarily a thing that was on the mind of anyone who came into this store. And, you know, the store I was in, we were right on the Appalachian Trail. So we would often keep mm -hmm. the parts of collections that weren't valuable. People would be like, do you have any books to read me? Be like, here's a, here's a basket of stuff we don't want. Take whatever you need. Um, but that what is behind the motive, you know, the motivation for collecting books, it, it is often quite different from I love books and I love reading. I wonder if you can talk a bit about that. They're two different disciplines, really. And some people have both and some people like to read and some people like to collect. And I, I saw someone call it the magpie urge. Some people like to have lots of shiny things. Uh, some people like to feel like they're keeping part of history for themselves or looking after it until it can be returned back to the trade. Um, and some people, I don't know, and they like to surround themselves with the idea that um, they might read it in the future. Um, you know, or <laughs> I have a lot of guests over and I will look very learned. Lots of different reasons to collect books in the same way that I guess people collect um, baseball cards, I suppose. But um, there's something special about books in the mind. That, or that, so long as they have been books, they have been book collectors and they don't read. I mean, you don't have time to read all the books. Who could possibly read all the books there are there are to read in the world before they die? You know, you have to choose very carefully when you're when you're in the world of books, what you read. You realize actually just how little time you have. <laughs> when you're in a world of books you see everything you go by you suddenly you're a lot more selective so I know I think there's a lot of aesthetic reasons people enjoy them I think you know they're seen as a um a not frivolous thing to collect I suppose isn't it I guess you know there's a certain certain, certain uh, weight to it I guess but lots of different reasons um but as I think you're right to point out that the very de la de low down the list is actually reading them for a lot of people that's you know almost adjacent to the issue <laughs> Yeah, and that at least it made me happy to hear, and we would always do the same thing that, you know, not everything in a collection is going to have value in your world, but it can often get passed to a different kind of bookseller where it might have value yeah. in reading and other things. I mean, often stuff that we have at Sutherland's that we can't, it's, it's amusing how often it happens. So we've been sitting on for 15, 20 years, we've been hawking it in every catalog. We show it to everyone who comes in, and everyone looks at us like we're insane. And then some other bookseller will see it in a catalog by chance, buy it from us and say, I have someone who's been looking for that um, since the beginning of time. And I'm so glad someone across crossed it. Like, we've had it for 20 years, Gavin. Like, how long does it, how long can it possibly have taken you to find it? Um, yeah, and it is a lot of it, book collecting and the value of books is just how, you know, will someone pay money for it? Is it worth something to someone monetarily? Um, and that really just means that the right person has to have money at the right time. <laughs> That's all that means. Yeah, yeah and, and finding that, I wonder if you can share some of your your uh, favorite moments where you have been able to to give someone exactly the book that they that they needed especially if it's not even oh, the one gosh. that they knew that they needed because it is such a good a good thing and now i'm on the spot <laughs> oh, sorry <laughs> no, it's hard to come by. Um, i mean you do in book selling you do a lot of there are a lot of days where nothing happens at all you know yeah um and inevitably someone comes and look for something that you just happen to have on the shelves and most of the time you, you ready yourself to say no mm -hmm. and they'll say do you have this and there'll be one thing out of the billions of books that have been printed and you'll think to yourself what are the chances that we have in the store so you're ready yourself to say no and they'll say isn't it that behind you um and you'll turn around and go oh yeah of i knew that was there of course of course i did <laughs> everyone i was just testing you clearly um and now that you passed the test uh we can sell it um, so it does happen more often than you think. People come in, they're, they're, they're looking for just the right thing. And often, you know, the book selling network, it's a bit like um, trees communicating via mycelium under the ground, you know, sort of if, if we know that someone comes in looking for something, like booksellers in London are quite dense. They're quite close together. Like mm -hmm. it doesn't usually take long to ring up another bookstore and say, actually, I think you had a copy of that. I saw that last year at your stand at the book fair. Mm -hmm. Can you run it over? 
because we have someone who wants it. So there is a certain level of you know, give and take between bookstores and the trade like that as well. Like the right book finds its way to someone. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. and that and that you're not every space isn't going to be able to specialize in every sort of yeah. thing. You've got a limited number of people, like you know, in each bookseller, generally, and the way it works, most bookstores I know of, that everyone has their kind, a little bit of kind of their area that they're they're more familiar with. Um, and even within those, so my colleague who does natural history and science, like he has, like he he likes Darwin, that's one of his areas, you know, but he might not know the science is a big area, you know. If I don't know physics came along, he might not be so confident. He might look to someone else in a different bookstore. So there's a lot of give and take, and a lot of passing books from one place to another to make sure that everyone gets something out of it. Yeah, I mean, it is definitely a, a thing where everyone everyone sort of thrives together because, as you said, who could ever know or read or uh, assess every book that's existed? Exactly. Yeah. Um, I I wondered if you you kind of touch on this a few times, and I'm guessing it's a it, you put it in there because it's a thing you get a lot. Um, you know that some people like collecting things that that are, we find morally repugnant um, and the challenge of dealing with, uh, with things that might be collected, but that we don't think are, are good things. Um, it's obviously a thing museums deal with. And I wonder if you could sort of talk about how you have, uh, how, how you and Sovereigns more generally has grappled with, lots of people like to collect Nazi memorabilia. What do we do? Yeah. So. so... The Southern, the book trade on Sutherlands as a whole, generally speaking, at least when I arrived, you know, behind where they should be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we, if you see, if you go to, um, I don't know, libraries, I've, I've, you know, I've seen a few publications by various librarians talking about how to catalog things, sensitive material, you know, and resources and, you know, uh, webinars and so on about how you address material in context in a collection. And book selling is slightly different, but it's also similar because people are going to walk into a bookstore every day, not necessarily expecting to see things that might not only shock them, but distress them, um, particularly if they're on a shelf. And so one of the first things that, you know, when, when I first arrived, uh, one of the things, one of the dramas that was going on, I'd say dramas, one of the, one of the, one of the, one of the grumblings below the surface that was going on was, was, a, was an argument about whether or not we should be keeping Gollywog material on the shelves because we had people who collected it. Um, and you know some some of whom you know are very good customers that have collected it for collections and because you know they're an archive on slavery and that kind of thing you know things are perfectly reasonable reasons to keep hold of this material but having it on the shelf almost looked like promoting it and mm-hmm. also if you walk in you might feel uncomfortable well, a lot of people might feel uncomfortable just walking in and saying down the shelf well, what are they advertising you know and things with you know we, if you have even things like Kipling where a swastika is quite common on the cover yep and reasons that have nothing to do with Nazis you suddenly face with this dilemma about what am I putting on my window in my window what am I mm-hmm. taking to book fairs and how am I contextualizing that so that the person who's buying it knows what they're buying and mm-hmm. how much do we limit or who do we we sell these things to like if I if I if I know you know like in my heart of hearts that somebody is buying uh, some of this material just they can put it in my cupboard and laugh wickedly at it isn't my responsibility to say actually I'm not you know, um, I found someone else to sell it to, you know, or it, can I can I do that? And those are conversations that the book traders only really, I think, just beginning to have properly. You know, so they're quite far behind, I think, you know, the museums and libraries, who I think have been on this question for a while. But it's been interesting to see those things develop, um, because obviously there's um, a lot of booksellers who are older than the tooth and have been quite happily not having to handle these things, might not have realised it was a problem. You have get some, some, sometimes some resistance there, and people who don't think anything needs to be done but I think it links into a broader question if you forgive me for rabbiting on um that about in, in welcoming more people to the book trade if you want more book collectors and you want people well even if, even from an economic sense you want people spending money and a broader selection of people you know customers uh, bringing other people into it then you need they all need to feel like they are you know not only welcome but also you know and uh, that that people are considering them when they're putting their stock in when they're buying or they're displaying how they're doing it and by not doing that you are closing off yourself off to a whole branch of people who, who will you know who will form opinions about you and your stock from what you put on the shelves so it's fascinating i don't have any answers yet because yeah. it's still in flux but um it's definitely something that people are beginning to kind of the cogs are beginning to turn the back of that industry that something needs to be done 
yeah. so happening. that's interesting and it's I mean it I'm thinking as you were talking about you know even where you put the book what section you know that that you in America like putting little black sambo in the children's section like the implication being like is that a book you would like children coming across there um you know, you know? Do, do, are we encouraging uh that that kind of uh yeah. encounter for people yeah like what am i what am i saying but where are my books and it's something that a lot of books like, haven't had necessarily had to think about in that way clearly from the questions that are being asked and from the objections that i've seen raised at various points that you know that's that, that's a new thing to have to consider i just want i just want to buy books and put them on my shelves some people say to me you know and i'm like well that's lovely i wish we had that luxury yeah. um, but i'm not sure that we do because the people that are buying don't necessarily have that luxury when they yeah. wander in you know it's a you know um they're faced with whatever they're faced with and that's our responsibility if we make people uncomfortable um yeah, well and and especially given that you said you know you may you may have someone who it comes in once a month for several years before you sell them something if they come in once and encounter something you yeah. may never get the chance to build that relationship. We may never develop that relationship and that's I mean it's so important that a lot of a lot of the, what we do is and it's rarely one and done with book collectors if they think if they rely on you and they think that you're you know that you'll get them good books in good condition you know which is you know, debatable depending on who you ask and you 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 drive with their catalog descriptions and you think that they'll consistently send you updates on good stuff that you're missing you know it's a rapport and you want the collectors coming back to you over and over again oh he got me a good thing on trees great he'll do that again like three or four times down the road um and so you don't want to cut that off with their path as i'm walking in thinking oh that bookseller's a bit racist i don't want to deal with them i'll never come back and you you're losing uh, customers and even from a curious point of view no morals at all like money hand over fist you know mm -hmm. people are going to not going to stop turning up um yeah. there was something obviously you want to avoid yeah well and and you know your the book makes it clear there's a spectacular section on the subletting of of part of the building you know that this is this is a thing where it's not you know there are many days where there's nothing is, there is no income at the end of the day uh, yeah so you've got to work on those relationships, but you do have a great section thinking about the same issue, but in a more positive way, um, the ways that reframing and resectioning and recataloging books under new headings can also be an important thing. And you talk uh, quite extensively about sort of uh, framing and promoting queer lit uh, in, this, in this kind of space. I wonder if you could talk a bit about the ways um, that, that booksellers have revisited how they've uh, how they've done this cataloging and and um, and retailing in ways that have attracted a broader audience. Yes, that's something that I've certainly seen develop while I've been at Southern Runs and from from other booksellers too, really. So when I first joined, and that was you know a little while ago now, um, very traditionally for antiquarian bookselling, you might find Christopher Ishwood on the shelves under modern literature, under memoirs or you know um personal biography or something you know you, you'd find it shelved under that and, and nowhere in the capital description would you know the, the, anything queer be mentioned because you wouldn't nobody it didn't do another dumb thing right you don't want to mention it um and some of those books sat on the shelves for years until we recatalogued them for what they you know for what they are for what they represent and for the concept kind of history that goes alongside them you know what it means for queer history you know where it slots in and they sell and that's a pattern that you see developed over and over with Oscar Wilde, with, uh, you know, you know, um, Bloomsbury Group. You know, if you if you collect it in the right way, people can find it. People who are looking for it will find it, and they are looking for it. Um, and that's why I think antiquarian books something has discovered relatively recently that if you put things in the appropriate context, don't shy away from it. The right people can. So those people are looking for things, and they just if you don't put the keywords in, they don't come up in searches. And so people who are looking for these books just will not come across them, you know, and make discoveries of their own. Um, and it's even more important with obscure, you know, um, that queer literature that people might not necessarily have heard of. If particularly if you don't, if people don't know to look for it, they will never find it. Yeah. Um, and so that's what's been uh, been really rewarding for us actually going back to our collections um, on a bunch of different notes. But um, that one for me is quite meaningful. Is going through and you know attracting customers that way, you know, by by making sure that our stock is accurately labelled for what it really means, you know, and not hiding away or, or, or putting things under. And I can see why, you know, in in the past it might have been advantageous not to label things for what they were for lots of reasons. Not only because some of our customers who used to buy those things didn't want 
a great big label on it saying it's a gay book mm -hmm. um, because they you know, they might not feel comfortable. Um, but certainly, I think in today's in today's market, um, it's it's important that that you know that we have access to it and things are internally at least labeled for what they are, so that we can make sure they end up um, promoted in that way and that people can find them when they need them. Yeah. Um, well, I never even I didn't think about it till just now, but that you know you don't have time to read every book, and not every person working there is going to know everything. So it's it's a it's a retail aid as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they, I mean, certainly I rely on the guy in travel to tell me when it's about you know elephants or if there's mm -hmm. something if if there's slavery involved somewhere or if there's you know I, I rely on those those that, that internal description telling me why I need to know if it's appropriate to offer to customers for various reasons. If they say I want something on I don't know Africa but I don't want tigers in it, like he has to label it to make sure that you know it, well, it doesn't have tigers in it, you know, or, or <laughs> what have you. And the same is true for literature. Mm -hmm. Um, so that you know if someone comes in saying actually I need a you know, um, presents for my son, his husband, or whatever, and he's saying, I want a, a gay book from whatever, then so they, they can find it. Otherwise, they, they you know. <laughs> yeah. It helps my well, colleagues and me. Certainly. Yeah. And and I think you sort of, you just spoke to this, but that that so much of this is about the chance encounter, um, that this isn't a thing where there's necessarily a card catalog. So you can, you know, look up three or four different themes and still find the same thing, where it is, where it is placed. Uh, has so much to do with whether or not people can encounter it, the kind of thing where no one can ask for a book they don't know exists. The mm. only way they can find it is is either through the long rapport or through chance. Yeah, the book says recommendation is a powerful tool. <laughs> and part of what we get based, part of what basically we get paid for is knowing the stock, mm -hmm. knowing our little section of it so well that when someone says, I want a Christine present, I go, I look them up and down and I go, what about these three things that they might not necessarily have heard of? Because often people don't know what they want. But even when they do, they don't know the title or something. You know, they're, they're forgotten. They're saying, it's, a, oh, a, it's got a blue cover. got a blue cover. I knew it when I was, when I was five. I had a book about I know, bunny rabbits and it had a blue cover. And some and sometimes, sometimes, by the grace of God, someone will go, I know what that is. Because mm -hmm. um, someone's asked it before, they've seen it, or say, actually, I have three possible things it could be. And they'll go and mm -hmm. pull them out. So yeah, having that in knowledge, that kind of file of fact knowledge of the stock you've got in and buying it yourself so you know what you've got. Um, yeah, it's a big part of the book started arsenal. Um, and so yeah, cataloging accurately is a useful. <laughs> yeah. And and uh I think you know, thinking about the differences between going into this kind of bookstore and um a, a regular, you know, just secondhand, but but also a new print run, you know, that it is it, it is a much uh, fiddlier, time consuming, you know, you're looking through, you can only kind of consume as much as you can consume. So having that expert staff and that good cataloging and signage, um, you know, that that I think we expect a certain amount of busy and, uh, you know, the, the vibe. But, there, you know, as you talked about going into that gentleman's house where you couldn't get into the thing, like going into one of these places where there are so many books just stacked in piles, you, you're you like, well, I can't, I, what if I want one that's in the middle? Where do I start? Yeah. Um, how do I, yeah. where do I begin is a thing people say to us a lot, actually. Yeah. Um, and so being able to onboard people and say, well, these are the things people would usually start with. These are the popular things. These are the affordable things. Um, this is the difference. You know, um, this is why it costs what it costs. Um, you know that's really useful for getting people into the into book collecting really because a lot of people want to start but they don't know how and the mm -hmm. bookseller is kind of almost your medium into the because once people have got a start started they can go to whatever bookstore they want but mm -hmm. if you forge that relationship at the start and that trust almost um you know people come back yeah yeah and you've you've kind of danced around this a bit um but i think it's it's an important aspect uh you know many of us will will have encountered Sotheran's first through the Twitter account, which, uh, you know, you were uh, behind. But but I think you talked a bit about um, the way the store sort of held back from and then finally kind of engaged with the world of online book selling, um, which, you know, has been a transformative thing over probably the past 30 years anyway, um, but is so different, is so different as a kind of book selling and book buying. I wonder if you could talk a bit about how uh, how approaching that and thinking about that um, 
Has, has it changed at all the way you do your storefront business? Has it uh, been a thing where it, it is a set of skills that maybe some people there don't have and it's not a thing that they can, you know, truck with? I mean, it's a thing that I think we're still, we're still navigating. I mean, Southern thinks of things in terms of decades, you know? Yeah. Um, and this decade has been about trying to figure out, um, figure out the internet. I mean, they, they, they were convinced a little while back they needed a better website because the one was actively hostile. <laughs> it practically drew a gun on you as you entered the room. Um, so that was just appalling. And so they changed that recently. And the, the difference in terms of, you know, traffic has been immense. And tra- with, with internet traffic follows football sometimes. People find you online and they come to see you. And that wasn't something that had really clicked in the back of the store's mind. I don't think that, you no, know, that they, I think they thought that if we, if we're too online, people will never come to the store, but actually it's the other way around. The awareness of you leads to football. Now football leads to people talking, the talking leads to people going online. It kind of a cyclic click. <laughs> it helps, it, everything helps itself. The more present, bigger presence you have online, the more football you tend to have. Like it all gets bigger together. Um, and but people, you know, most of the people sort of don't have any interest in interacting with uh, computers any more than they have to. It's an antagonistic relationship, and I kind of get that. Um, and so we have one or two people who are at the store whose job it is to interact with online things and put things online. Um, but otherwise, you know, they'll, they'll they they catalog the books the same way they always do. They put them on the shelves the same way they always do. Somebody organizes a mailing list, you know, to the people who buy things online. Um, the one thing that has changed is. Well, I mean, they only really engaged with it relatively recently, I think. But e- e- the email has changed stuff for them. I think that has stuck. It's one of the things that's going to stick because it's a bit like it's like writing a letter, which they understand, but quicker. <laughs> um, and you can develop that. It's, it's similar to someone coming in and speaking to you over and over again. People will that that, that direct one to one relationship. You know, mm-hmm. it's something that booksellers value, and cultivating that mm-hmm. leads to sales directly, really, and. I think everything else, all the other avenues of social media, the website and stuff, are basically just a you know, picture plant to draw in people who could then be interacted with on a more personal level and finding those few people who are going to spend money repeatedly and who want to be recommended stuff. Mm-hmm. But it's all a great big net you put out in the hope that you know people who want books will quite happily roll into it and spend the rest of their lives trading books with you. Um, that's what you're looking for. You know, you're spreading very wide and very thin in the hope that you'll you'll attract people who want the same thing you do out of that relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. And I, I realize I, like in many ways, all the questions I'm asking, they are not nearly as funny as as most of the book <laughs> is. In in part because I was like, no, I can't just I can't just read read passages <laughs> out loud uh that are really good in here, but but it is it uh that is definitely really one of the selling points in here that there are just uh, so many uh, beautifully colorful and wonderful descriptions of people. Um, and you really do get a great sense of the cast of characters and people who work there and people who come in. Um, and this may be another two on the spot, but for, for my last question, then we can do Q&A. Um, is there a character, a favorite character of yours who didn't end up in the book? Uh, <laughs> so we don't, that, that you can speak about it. The, I will note the book starts with a, a a note from Oliver's supervisor. <laughs> um, so this is, has been blessed in some way, but I wonder if there's someone who, not for for bad reasons, but just didn't didn't end up in here. What can I say? Yeah. So um, <laughs> what can you say? There are two chapters that were removed from the book <laughs> by the manager, who was like, "You can't publish those, Oliver. We'll get in trouble." <laughs> As in those people will know this is As about those them. Those people will know it's about them. <laughs> one, one thing I will say is that so most of the people in the book, the the you know the various. People that come into the bookstore, they're kind of chimeras of the kinds of people that come in. And what I didn't want to do was pick most people out of a crowd and say, oh, that they're, they're hilarious. And it wasn't punching down kind of mm-hmm. material here. It's about the fact that, you know, you, about, about that ecosystem you develop with people you're familiar with, um, who have these odd habits. Um, so most of, the, most of the people and the kind of the cryptids and you know, so on are conflict sort of conflagrations of people kind of merged together for aspects mm-hmm. of them. We, we built them from almost from scratch, some of them. And one of them, I basically ripped from real life, um, thinking I'd get away with it. And the other day, I, I got a text from Rebecca at the bookstore that was just, he knows, in block capitals. <laughs> oh, no. Um, so I haven't been back since. Um, and I'm hoping that, <laughs> hoping that, I don't know, I'll die before he turns up again or something. That's my that's my gambit. Um, <laughs> but the less about that, the better. Oh, that's excellent. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and I do appreciate that you, you know, most of these people are delightfully quirky and eccentric, but that 
that the few moments where there can be some real pills uh, that you encounter, <laughs> and then it's understood that like not everyone's custom is is valuable no. or worth worth cultivating. Not everyone, no. Um, when 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 do you snap? Uh, that's the, the, the moment. The line sometimes, yeah. Like it, it, yeah. sometimes it's not worth the trouble. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so know? we have some great questions here, and I'm going to start. I think with the order that I got them. Um, uh, Christine says she's almost done with the book. I thought it was amusing your commentary regarding the tendency for antiquarian bookstores to use the colors green and gold, yet you chose that for your cover. Yay. Yeah, uh, it's kind of that so little joke, a... I think. Um, you have to forgive us. <laughs> so that was it's intentional? Just, yeah, yeah, it's one of our, like, I think almost, so, I mean, the, the uh, publisher for um, the American publisher, Norton, who were very good for this, um, they put together a whole bunch of possible covers. And it was, we I went on a tenth version. I was like, no, no, we're not, no, it's terrible. We couldn't figure it out. And they kind of said, what if we did it like it was an old book, Oliver? I'm like, yes. <laughs> we're going to blame to all the stereotypes. Uh, we're going to have this green and gold, you know, cover, kind of green like arsenic kind of vibe to it. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I, they do it. And it came out looking looking really nice. Yeah, but it's also a little bit of a joke. Yeah, about this is this is what everything looks like. <laughs> well, and it does have does have lovely end papers. Uh, thankfully, it doesn't have, I'll use the term, deco edge uh pages oh my, God, yeah, my, my personal hatred that's when the pages are all different different lengths and you can't flip through it so mm. frustrating uh, yeah, i will say <laughs> for those of you who i mean as an extra bonus there is a um there is a miniature book selling rpg in the back <laughs> of this book which is uh which is an incredible uh little thing and i can't i can't wait to play this um what <laughs> what once the bathroom minus one patience. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. I snuck that one in at the end. I was like, can we sneak this in? Just you know, I'm noticing. So it's it's so there. good. Well, and Candy says, you know, talks about the humor in the book. Um that that this is what could be a dry esoteric or lead a subject and made it accessible. And wants to know how much of your engagement with, with the public include that sense of humor, or is the you know, the the rare book world, both the public and private engagements, a little more austere. It depends who you're speaking to, really. I mean, and so, it depends what bookstore you're in. I mean, some bookstores have a reputation for being, you know, white gloves and sadness. Mm -hmm. um, and some bookstores are a bit more genial. I think we, at Southern ones, we try and be more accessible most of the time. Um, it's difficult to know what people want when they come in as well. Some people want you to be off British to them. They think it makes it, makes it seem exclusive. Mm -hmm. um, and some people, you know, just want a conversation. So until you, you kind of get a read on people eventually and, and you, know, you kind of warm up to them very quickly, if we, they be like they're just there to mooch around, they want to have a talk. Um, I think, yeah, you mooch around until you find a bookseller that has a temperament that suits you. And if they're crabby or they don't like them, don't go back. You know, um, there's lots of booksellers who are quite reasonable. Um, you know, uh, and I think you can you can be funny and be accessible and still sell books. Um, you know, um, some booksellers have got into their head that you need to be rude, um, which I don't think is a necessity. Um, <laughs> arguably, not necessary at all. Um, uh, so yeah, it would, think, it would yeah. be odd for that to be the one area of retail where rudeness is actually <laughs> a positive. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Um, they're convinced. Uh, but yeah, I think um, I think you have to um, try and find the right bookseller for you and find someone who's temperament suits you because, like everyone else, you know, they vary. Uh, but I think more and more booksellers are engaging with the idea that you know. If you're friendly, you get nice things back. <laughs> That's nice. Uh, a revelation. Well, yeah. and it, it, you know, talking about the the importance of having someone already in there to get people in. Um, I think the second level is like people sometimes think these places are libraries and they can't talk. And and if somebody isn't already talking in there, or you're, it's you and someone else and just the bookseller, it can feel like well they're listening to my conversation. Well, yeah, but also because yeah. you're the only. Yeah, only people in here. Yeah, the, the, it, it's strange how magic it is having one extra person in the book sort of mooching around, and how many more people just walk in. I think people mm -hmm. don't want to feel overly scrutinized, and I get that. Like, I don't mm -hmm. want to feel like I'm being watched. Who does? Um, and so feeling like there's someone else to distract, you know, whoever's working there's attention almost, or feel like it's divided mm -hmm. somehow, so you're not feeling watched as to what you're looking at or what you're picking up the shelves. No pressure, really. That you is, can, if necessary, leave without buying something without being you, watched you know, all the without, way up. <laughs> like laser eyes out the door yeah so i think that that is important yeah uh eric wants to know is there an era of antiquarian books that collectors are more interested in than others say dickensian or victorian or turn of the last century i mean it depends on the collector and the bookstore really the, the bookstores will develop their own list of clients see, over time 
<laughs> and somewhere like, I don't know, there's a bookstore called John Dice, who is near the British Museum. Well, I thought that was I um, thought that was going to be a joke with that. No, name. the real John Dice and John Dice. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> um, and they they do they, they specialize in a particular area of literature. Is it 19th century stuff now? I think I'm terrible. They're going to scold me for this. Um, but in other way, they developed a clientele basically is devoted to that because they only sell a certain kind of book. They have a massive client that's full of people who want that kind of book. See, and so they would tell me everyone wants that. Um, and at Sutherland, you know, we have a hodgepodge of stuff. People come to us for all sorts of things. And the problem is, you know, um, uh, if you if you have a big gen generalist bookstore like that covers a lot of bases like ours, you get people asking for lots of different things. And if you're a specialist, then you can only sell a specialist type of thing to your client list. So it depends how how wide you are willing to go with your stock and how long you're willing to wait to build up a list of customers. And, you know, how long a piece of string, I guess, is the answer to that question. Yeah. Um... One thing, and I, I don't know how much you would want to talk about this, but one thing I thought um, was really uh, kind of moving at places in the book is the way that you uh, all of a sudden realized that maybe the, you know, the problem had always been that you were not unemployable. The problem had been the places you were working before were not suited to the way you worked. And I wonder if you could talk a bit about that realization that that this this place fit you um, compared to some of those other other jobs you'd had before. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a firm believer that you know that if you leave someone alone for long enough, that they'll find some purpose of their own, something that something they like doing. Whether that's I read, I like reading all the time and learning things. Whether it's you know I like playing the video games and beating my best score. Whether it's I'm, I'm building chairs. Whether it's selling books. That some people will find, gravitate their way towards some kind of purpose and execute it in a way that, that that fits them and I think if you when, when you try and I went to a lot of office jobs I was terrible at it because they would require me to remember things and answer things really quickly and I will answer things you know in a week or when it's pertinent and <laughs> urgent things when urgent things come you know um they didn't have time you know not many office jobs have time for me to, to take a nap of an afternoon but a rare book selling <laughs> is one of those things where you know you're expected to do a lot of sitting around waiting you know and a lot of book cataloging a lot of things that are quiet and slow and done in pretty much your own time and you're expected to be happy on keeping your own business you know um and not a lot of conversations if you don't want them um which would drive some people up the wall i'm sure um so when i you know when i walked into book selling i realized that, you know for a while i was quite paranoid that i wasn't doing enough you know or not quickly enough at least until i realized that was part of the, the being able to exist in that environment and do things slowly and not go mad like was actually a you know a qualification of itself like a lot of people couldn't actually do that some people wouldn't be able to do that um mm -hmm. so different temperaments that suit different jobs i guess and i think i was quite fortunate to walk into that one that suited me um and it did take me a while to come to that realization that i wasn't doing it wrong because there are other jobs that asked different things of me um i think different professions have different requirements of different kinds of people um and if you're lucky you'll find the one that suits you yeah um, I, you know, that you mentioned sort of thinking like, well, someone's going to come and fire me. Clearly I haven't done yeah. enough, but, but that even as an apprentice, uh, that both you were treated with the deep skepticism that is inherent in the profession, <laughs> but also a lot of trust that like, well, the, you know, you said we, we think on the scale of decades that, that, that almost pervaded your training process that it, you know, at the end when they get it, there's another apprentice. Well, I guess you're not the apprentice anymore. And I have to say, I had no sense in this book in a good way of when it started and when it <laughs> en ended like I, I didn't have any sense of how long it was how long you were here how long it was taking you to do these things which was kind of a really nice and relaxing but a little unsettling yeah it was part of when I put the book together one of the first things I said to the agent when I was writing was that um like it wasn't going to be a chronological book in that sense not really because mm -hmm. when you I I'm, I'm convinced and I say this a lot that bookstores have their own idea of time moved differently in a rare bookstore mm -hmm. um and you know it, sometimes sometimes things seem, seem like they take years and it's in an afternoon and sometimes things seem like they take an afternoon you've been there for years um and tasks come and go like so I'll start a task in January I'll come back to it in June and then realize that I completed it in March and you know it's it got, things go back and forth and I I think that that sense I wanted that sense of you know the perpetuity or, or chronological peculiarity to pervade the book as well because that's how it feels to work out a place like you don't realize time and so much time's passed and how much you've done what order it happened I can't remember what all the things happened then part of it is for my sake because I can't even remember 
what order things occurred in. So <laughs> I'm glad it felt that way because that was the intent. <laughs> yeah, no, ab absolutely. And in a, in a good way, I, well, I was thinking sort of like at the best, you could sort of do seasons because maybe the mm. traffic changes, changes seasonally. Um, but it was, it was good in that way. And I will say the structure of the book is, um, I won't say it's anecdotal, but it's, it's brief uh, episodes. Um, as you're you're kind of learning the trade along with Oliver, you are. Um, it very much feels like a process of discovery of this world that you brought us through, which is why I think the timeless nature works because it's sort of once you've gone through these doors, this is a place with its yeah. own rhythms and its own people. And even then, once you've been in, it feels like you know some kind of Greek myth where once you've been in, even when you go back out into the world, you're a, a changed person. Yeah, and not the, not and the interactions same. are never the same. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, everything, yeah, everything's held up to that. To that, yeah. Um, there were some incredible moments, I have to say. Uh, this is worth reading, if only for the story of how how Southern's rubbish is taken care of. Um, mm -hmm. It's pretty, it's pretty spectacular. Um, <laughs> Uh, and and I, I I was texting my coworkers because that that exact same thing happens in our workplace and you should read it and find out if it happens in yours as well. Um, oh, it, it's fast. It, it is it is a wonderful like a real workplace comedy in those ways. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else has any more questions. I had just like a thousand notes and uh, and things like this. Um, I, oh, there was one more thing that I wanted to ask. Oh, I did want to say for anyone who's who's watching this from the US, who's on the East Coast, um, if you are looking for a haunted bookstore here, Banks, uh, Bank Square Books in Mystic, um, my department went on a uh, haunted uh, downtown Christmas tour a few years ago, and I almost got frostbite, but one thing I learned was which bookstores were haunted. <laughs> so I wondered maybe if we want to close with, um, you know, we've we've said the name a bunch of times, um who who are the Southerns and and sort of what how do they live or haunt the work that you do now in that bookstore so the, the Southerns founded the bookstore in, in York which is the other big book selling hub yep. in the UK um in about 1760 um and some scandal caused an offshoot of the Southerns to be banished down to London and that version of the bookstore is the one that survived York one vanished again there's a lot of arguments going on about exactly why no one knows mm -hmm. um and then bounced around London opening and closing stores until they ended up in Sackville Street for some reason, um, which was abandoned by everyone else and nobody else ever opened a store there. Um, and they just kind of sat there and the, the various Southerns, you know, lived and died in this family tree until it came to the most recent one who was in the middle of the 20th century without any heirs, uh, walked into Piccadilly and was hit by a tram. Um, and so the, <laughs> in theory, he haunts the bookstore, he keeps opening cases and rattling pipes and so on. <laughs> That's what we say. Um, and it was then taken over and bought by one of philanthropists or another who then sold it to someone else. But in, in theory, the last Southern died in the middle of the 20th century. So now, you know, um, ghosts, a few portraits, a few spooky portraits in the walls of various Southerns. Um, yeah, they're around mostly, but there's a lot of mystique going with that. We had somebody write a company history um, uh, a few years ago, yeah. which was like, it's a lot. It's a process. Yeah. Like it's a very good doorstop. Um, <laughs> But the, the opening chapter has a lot to say about not being able to find anything about them, which is quite fascinating. That's I, I'm just imagining the the split between the brothers that produced Aldi and Trader Joe's here in America, the two German brothers. You know, <laughs> which of these which of these ends? Uh, but and that I think is one of the things that's really um, really charming about it is that you know this this isn't any books bookshop. This is a place with a with a history as opaque as it is, as unclear or non-existent <laughs> as its archive is. Um, but you know, thinking about like once you've gone in, you've been changed, you you come back out into a modern world that's changing um around you. Uh, but that it is still a place inhabited by sort of these are modern cryptids. These are people that live in our world. Um yeah, we adjust and have yeah, and they have this lovely place that allows them to be their weird selves um, as customers or book runners or uh, employees. Um, yeah, long man continue. Yes, um, <laughs> so it is. It is honestly just uh, page for page one of the funniest books that I have I have ever read. And I will say, like, this is not a book that you need to have worked in one of these places to enjoy. If you are a person who who just likes bookstores, uh, this. 
this will be a real joy to read and will make you think differently about um, about about your library. I keep looking over at my bookshelf. <laughs> I have where I've just had to buy a new bookcase and I now have to figure out how to get it up into the servant swing here. But why couldn't I just keep stacking things this just way? Keep stacking. Just, keep, just stacking. keep stacking. It'll be fine. <laughs> so uh, so thank you so much, Oliver, for chatting with me today. And um, I this is this is going to get passed around to a lot of people. Um, uh, and there are there are there are some bits in here. Where I was like, someone's going to make a sampler out of this line and put it on the wall in their establishment. <laughs> um, because it's it's really excellent. So uh, thank you so much for spending time with me here on my on my lunch hour. Um, and thanks to everybody who joined us. You can get Oliver's book uh, through the link in the chat. I encourage you all to do so. Uh, Omar, do we have any closing business? Yeah, sure. Um, yes, uh, thank you so much, Oliver. Um, and thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, thanks to our audience. Uh, I wanna do a little shout out to my partner who is a rare book archivist at a academic library. Um, so I have that connection to, to rare books myself. Um, so uh, yes, uh, everyone who's watching, please join us for future programs, virtual programs on May 4th. We'll be talking to the author of Like Literally Dude arguing for the good in bad English. On May 23rd, we'll be talking to Simon Winchester about his new book, Knowing What We Know, The Transmission of Knowledge from Ancient Wisdom to Modern Magic. And on May 30th, we'll be talking to the author of For the Culture, The Power Behind What We Buy, What We Do, and Who We Want to Be. Um, and finally, please join us at the museum for a tour. Um, if you're nearby, we're open six days a week from 9.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And you can visit our brand new exhibit for business or pleasure, Twain Summer Sojourns, which focuses on the Clemens family's American summer vacations between 1870 and 1910. It's a really awesome exhibit. If you're nearby, uh, please come visit us. Um, and that is all for, for from us for today. Um, have a great afternoon. Have a good evening, Oliver. Um, and uh, we'll see you again soon. <laughs>